So this lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will be about the symmetric and alternating groups. So we will start just by recalling what these are. So the symmetric group um, Sn is all permutations of n points. And we may as well call these points 1, 2, up to n. And its order is n factorial because it can take 1 to any one of these n points. And the permutation can then take 2 to any of the n minus 1 points that aren't in the image of 1 and so on. So we get n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on. It's got a subgroup a, a n called the alternating group, which is index 2 and order n factorial over 2, at least if n is not equal, uh, if n is greater than 1. Um, and a n is the group of all permutations fixing the following polynomial, you just take the product over naught less than i less than j less than equal to n of xi minus xj. So for instance, for n equals 3, this looks like x1 minus x3, x2 minus x3, x1 minus x2. And you can see if you permute these numbers 1, 2, and 3, you will permute these factors, except you may change the sign of some of these factors. So any um, permutation of the symmetric group maps this polynomial either to this polynomial or minus this polynomial. And we actually get a homomorphism from Sn to the group with two elements plus or minus one, depending on whether it multiplies this polynomial by one or minus one. And a n is just the kernel of this homomorphism. So we get a little exact sequence of groups like this. And this map is on two if n is at least two. So a n has half the order of s n. And we notice that a n is normal in Sn because it's the kernel of a homomorphism. So um, we'll now just quickly recall what the symmetric groups look like for small values. So the symmetric group S1 is kind of uninteresting. It's just a trivial group, as is A1. S2 has order 2, so it's just isomorphic to the cyclic group of order 2. And A2 is, again, trivial. S3 is isomorphic to the dihedral group of order 6, consisting of all symmetries of a triangle. And the alternating group A3 is, of course, just the rotations of a triangle, which is just, just a cyclic group of order 3. So, so far, nothing very much is going on. S4 is a bit unusual. Um, it contains the alternating group A4, but the alternating group A4 has an extra normal subgroup z over 2z times z over 2z. Um, so this is normal. You remember this group here is generated by the permutations 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 4, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2, 4. And uh, this is the only case in which an alternating group has a normal subgroup other than the trivial subgroup and the whole group. Um, so the alternating group is A4. It's also rotations of a tetrahedron. You can think of these four points as being the four corners of a tetrahedron. The group S4 um, has an extra normal subgroup. It's got this normal subgroup Z2 times Z2. And again, it's the only symmetric group that has a normal subgroup other than the symmetric group and the alternating group and the trivial group. And it's equal to rotations of a cube or an octahedron. Um, so you can see this 
um, if we've got a cube, a cube actually has four diagonals and any rotation of a cube acts on these four diagonals and by fiddling around with a cube you can convince yourself that the rotations of a cube give you exactly all permutations of these four diagonals. Um, S4 is also equal to all symmetries of the tetrahedron where you allow reflections as well as rotations. And then we get to S5, which only contains A5 and contains one. And A5 is rotations of an icosahedron, as we will see later when we talk about it in more detail. A5 is an example of a simple group. So this is no normal subgroups. other than, than um, one and itself. So um, groups with no normal subgroups other than one of themselves are of course called simple groups. So sim some simple groups are the cyclic groups of prime order and A5 is the smallest simple group that isn't cyclic of prime order. We'll probably say more about those later. Um, symmetric groups, Beyond this, um, we get S6 and A6. S6 is unusual because it has some extra automorphisms um, which aren't at all obvious. So any group has automorphisms called inner automorphisms given by conjugacy by an element. So if you map x to gx, g to the minus 1, this is an automorphism of the group. And S6 is rather unusual in, in that it's got some extra automorphisms, not of this form, as we will see a bit later, maybe. Um, so next, we want to look at conjugacy classes of Sn and An. And the conjugacy classes of Sn are quite easy to describe. In fact, the symmetric groups are one of the very few groups where the conjugacy classes are easy to describe. So let's look at a typical element of Sn. So it might do something like this. So suppose it takes, let me number these, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it might take the element one to three, three to five, five to six, six back to one, and then it might take two to four and four to two. And you see the um, any permutation of these six points can be split up into cycles. So we write this permutation in shorthand notation like this. We write one, three, five, six. This just means the cycle taking one to three, three to five, five to six, and six to one. And then we've got another cycle, two, four. So any element of Sn is a product of disjoint cycles. So a cycle is just where you cyclically permute the elements as if they were sort of around the edges of a circle or something. Um, also, um, if A is this element here, if we conjugate A by some element G, all, that, all that's doing is it's renaming these elements according to G. So this has the same cycle shape. So um, it will be a, a, a cycle of four elements and a cycle of two elements. So we see that a conjugacy class gives us a cycle shape, where a cycle shape is something of the form 1 to the n1, 2 to the n2, 3 to the n3, and so on, meaning we've got, one, we've got n1 cycles of length 1, n2 cycles of length 2, and so on. So this would be a cycle shape 1 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 3 to the 0, 4 to the 1. And of course, you usually miss out one to the zero and three to the zero out of laziness. Um, conversely, um, 
any two elements of the same cycle shape are conjugate. Um, and this is sort of obvious if you remember that saying two things are conjugate just means you're, you're relabeling the things you're permuting. So let's do an example. Suppose A is equal to 1, 2, 3, um, 4, 5, 6, 7. And B is equal to 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, 7, 5. And the problem is find G. So G A G to the minus 1 equals B. So we want to actually, I mean, we can sort of see informally that A and B are conjugate because all we have to do is to find G relabeling the elements to get from there to there. And you do it like this. All we have to do is do this permutation. So, so, so this, is the, this is the permutation G in blue. So in other words, G takes one to six, then it takes six to seven, then it takes seven to five, then it takes five to one, and it takes two to four, and it takes four to two, and it takes three to itself. Um, and now you can check that g to the minus one a g equals b. So, um, so if, if I start with this element six, I apply g to the minus one, I go up to here, then I apply a, I get to two, then I apply G and I get to four, and you see I've, I've met six to four, which is what B is. Um, so this sort of makes it obvious that if two elements have the same cycle shape, then they're conjugate and gives you a constructive way of finding an element mapping one to the other. Of course, G is not unique because I could have written B as say four, three, six, one, two, five, seven. And then I would get a different element conjugating A to B. Um, so, for example, we can now work out the conjugacy classes of um, any symmetric group. So the conjugacy classes of Sn just correspond to cycle shapes of length in other words, we want 1 to the n1, 2 to the n2, um, k to the nk, with n1 plus 2n2 plus 3n3 plus knk equals n. And if you think about it, this is the number. It's just the number of partitions of n because this is just a number of ways of writing n as a number of small integers. For example, let's find the conjugacy classes of S4. So we can write 4 is equal to 4, or it's 3 plus 1, or 2 plus 2 plus 1, or 2 plus 1 plus 1, or 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. And this gives us the conjugacy classes either a four cycle, a three cycle, so this might be A, B, C, D, or A, B, C, or it might be two two cycles, so it might look like A, B, C, D, or it might look like A, B, or it might just be the identity element, where I, I'm not bothering to write the cycles of length one because they're just trivial and uninteresting. The next question is, how many elements are there in each conjugacy class? Well, again, this is fairly easy to work out. The size of the conjugacy class is equal to the size of an orbit under G, because um, the conjugacy class is just acted on by G, so you can think of it as being an orbit of G acting on itself by conjugation. And the size of an orbit is just G over 
the size of the subgroup fixing a point. And the subgroup fixing a point of this conjugacy class is just G over the subgroup commuting with um, one permutation. So we've got to figure out what the subgroup fixing a permutation is. So let's write down a permutation and figure out what its subgroup is. So here, here's a permutation. We might fix a few points. And then we might have a few points that are mapped to each other. Let me do these all in the same direction. Then we might have some triples. We might have some cycles of length three and some cycles of length four and so on. So here's a typical permutation. So this particular one has cycle shape one cubed, two squared, three to the one, um, four squared. And now let's try and find permutations that commute with this. Well, first of all, we can permute any of these three points. So we get a subgroup S3 of order three factorial permuting these. Um, then, um, um, the, the, this, this cycle here commutes with this permutation. So we also get a two cycle like this. This gives us a group of order two. And we've got another group of order two here because this cycle of order two commutes with everything. But then we can permute these two. We can act on, this, on these two with a symmetric group S2. And this gives us another factor of two factorial. And here um, we've got a cycle of order three commuting with everything. So that gives us a factor of three. And then we can commute, permute this one element, which gives us a symmetric group S1 of order one factorial. And similarly, here we get a factor of four from this. Um, sorry, I guess that should be going that way around. And a factor of four from this. And we can permute these with a symmetric group S2. So we get an element order two factorial. So we see that this element here um, commutes with a group of order um, 1 to the 3 times 3 factorial times 2 squared times 2 factorial times 3 to the 1 times 1 factorial times 4 squared times 2 factorial. And you can check that these, in fact, give you all things permuting, commuting with this particular cycle. So the order of the centralizer of a permutation of shape 1 to the n1, 2 to the n2, 3 to the n3, and so on, is just 1 to the n1 times n1 factorial, 2 to the n2 times n2 factorial, and so on. So the size of the conjugacy class is equal to n factorial divided by 1 to the n1 times n1 factorial, 2 to the n2 times n2 factorial, and so on. So this gives us an easy way to work out the size of every conjugacy class. So let's do this for S4, just work out the size of the conjugacy classes. So the permutations have cycle shapes 4, 3, 1, 2 squared, 1 squared. Uh, that doesn't sound right. 2 squared, 2, 1 squared, and 1 to the 4. And then the order of the centralizer is 4 or 3 or 2 squared times 2 or 2 times 1 squared times 2, or um, 4 factorial, which is 24. So the size of the class, so the size of the conjugacy class is just 24 divided by this number here, which is 6, or 8, or, f or I can't do a division, or 3, or 6, or 1. 
And now, as a reality check, we should check that these numbers here add up to 24, which is the size of the group. So we have indeed found all the conjugacy classes and their sizes. Um, conjugacy classes in the alternating group are similar but slightly trickier. Are similar, but um, classes of Sn sometimes split into two classes of a n. So for example, let's look at a3 contained in s3. So the conjugacy classes of s3, there's there's one, there's one, two, three, and one, three, two, and there's one, two, two, three, three, one. So these are the three conjugacy classes. Now these elements aren't in a n, so we can forget about them. But in A3 has three conjugacy classes. There's one, one, two, three, and one, three, two. So this class of S, the symmetric group, has split into two different conjugacy classes of, of the alternating group. And the problem is the element that conjugates this class into this class is one of these elements, which isn't actually in the alternating group. Um, similarly, if we look at A4 contained in S4, we find that there's one conjugacy class of elements of, of cycle shape like that. But if we think of A4 as the group of rotations of a tetrahedron, it's got two conjugacy class of elements of order three because we can point a vertex towards us and either rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise. So this, is, this again has two classes of order three. This only has one class order three. So you might think, well, maybe, you know, classes of elements of order three are always going to split into two classes, but that doesn't hold because if we look at A5 containing S5, this contains one class of elements of order three, but A5 also contains one class of elements of order three. Well, how come? Well, you might say, you know, we, we, we saw this, what, why are these two in the same conjugacy class? Well, we can actually conjugate this element into this element by um, using the permutation 2, 3. Well, that's no good because 2, 3 isn't in the alternating group, but now I can multiply it by the element 4, 5, and um, um, this is equal to g times 1, 2, 3 times g to the minus 1. So these two elements are conjugate in A5 because you've now got these two spare elements, 4 and 5, that you can use to make this um, odd, th 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 this element not in the symmetric group into an element of the symmetric group. So conjugacy classes of alternating groups are a little bit tricky. Um, the conjugacy classes of the symmetric group sometimes split into two classes and sometimes they don't. And there's a rule for telling you when it does and when it doesn't, but I can never remember what this rule is, because, so I won't bother giving it. Um, next, we um, want some generators for the group Sn. So generators mean we want to find some particularly simple elements such that any element of Sn can be written as a product of them. And the generators are going to be these transpositions, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, and so on, up to n minus one n. These are called transpositions. So a transposition is a permutation that just exchanges two elements and nothing else. And we want to show that every permutation is a product of these. And to do this, we use the notorious bubble sort. So the bubble sort algorithm is the following problem. Suppose you've got a collection of objects which are not in order and you want to put them in order. For instance, 
suppose I've got um, um, several pens and I want to put them in order of putting the lightest colors to the left. So I want yellow, orange, red, and blue. And what I do is I keep switching the order of two of them so I can switch orange and red, and then I can switch these two, 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 and I finally got them in order. So I'm, I, I can get them all in order just by switching two neighboring elements. Um, the bubble sort, this is called bubble sort, and it's kind of notorious for being a really awful sorting algorithm. Um, it's, it's much, much, much slower than the best sorting algorithms, but um, I mean, it used, writing bubble sort used to be given as an exercise in introductory programming classes, and the problem with this is that bubble sort ended up being used as a sorting algorithm in actual computers, which made them all rather slow. Anyway, fortunately, bubble sort has been more or less eradicated from computing, but it's still very useful in the theory of the symmetric group. So um, you see bubble sort is really just using these particular transpositions to change the order of some object. In other words, give you a permutation. So um, I think rather than give a formal proof of these generate SN, I'll just give an example which should hopefully make it obvious. So um, suppose you want to change one, two, three, the permutation one. Suppose you want to um, have the permutation that takes one, two, three, four, five to three, four, two, five, one. Um, then I can sort of do a sort of bubble sort. So I take one, two, three, four, five, and now I'm going to switch one and two. And now I'm going to switch one and three get two, three, one, four, five. So I'm bringing one up to the last position, two, three, one, four, one. Now I switch these two, and then I switch one to here, two, three, four, five, one. And now you see by switching adjacent ones, I brought the element one to this position here. And now um, nearly everything is in the right position. Now, now I've got to get, um, I, I, I want to move three up a bit so I can, so, so I want to move three down to here so I can switch two and three. And now I want to switch the order of two and four. So I get three, four, two, five, one. And it's kind of obvious that by doing this, you can, you can change this to any other permutation. And now if you look at this, what has happened is this is the transposition one, two. This is the transposition two, three. Um, Um, and that's that's a bit confusing. So what this means is if I if I do one two, um, so, so so if I do the transposition one two followed by two three, it means it's a function that takes one to position two, and then this function takes takes two to three. So it's rather confusing because this is acting on positions, not on the actual elements. So this isn't the, this isn't the transposition one, three, it's the transposition two, three. And then I do three, four, and four, five, and then one, two, and two, three. So um, this, trans, this permutation is equal to one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, one, two, two, three. And it's sort of fairly obvious that you can get any permutation of any symmetric group by doing something similar. Um, what we want to do now is um, discuss relations between these transpositions. And I think I'll leave that for next lecture since this has gone on for about half an hour. So next lecture, we will be doing the Coxeter-Todd algorithm.